Hi, it's the next instalment in the Power Supply series. Last time we looked at the Revision A schematic and I mentioned, uh, you know, a few things on there I could uh, possibly change and, well, I've done just that. So let's take a look at Rev B and see what the changes are. And here's the old Rev A schematic you've seen before. And ta-da, here is Rev B. Uh, one of the major changes, the formatting of the uh, schematic, uh, really, this is now an A3. Uh, format sheet because I really was trying to cram a lot of stuff onto this A4 sheet and I was just able to do it and I've added a couple of extra chips so it wasn't really possible to keep that um, uh, you know single A4 sheet and I didn't want to split it up so I've put it onto an A3 I've made it a bit uh, modular and uh, there's a few changes a couple of extra chips and we'll go through them uh, one by one see what the changes are and why I did them this modular aspect to the schematic just makes it uh, a bit nicer because it's you know, ADC separate over here, the microcurrent part, the uh, USB interface, the uh, the new I squared C uh, IO section, the power supply I've integrated with the DAC here. I could have made the DAC as a separate module like I did the ABC, but it's all sort of part of the same one and the Arduino compatible AVR microcontroller plus a few miscellaneous things here. I could tidy it up, but uh, now this is the Arduino controller from the previous Rev A schematic and uh, as it turns out I was trying to drive the LED uh, on the reset line there and as it turns out that's uh, not a good thing to do on these uh, AVR microcontrollers because you have to burn the fuse which then means you can't do in-system serial programming. So uh, while I could use this as a LED output to drive there I would only have a one-shot deal of programming this micro and that's no good at all and uh, you know you don't know those things unless you read the uh, the detailed uh, parts of the data sheet so I had to free up that uh, reset pin there and uh, and also I was sharing um, part of the ISP interface down here with the uh, SPI bus uh, for my um, ADC and DAC or the uh, DAC actually so I decided to uh, change that around free up I had to free up that reset pin and uh, that really started a whole cascade of changes because as you can see every single pin was actually used on there so just that the act of freeing up that one pin meant it drove me into various design design decisions that um, forced me into using uh, external I squared C IO devices over here and we'll take a look at those later but um, basically I didn't have enough free pins but with those external uh, chips dedicated to IO I freed up a few pins but um, as you can see I'm still using all of the pins and as I mentioned previously I wanted to use an external uh, oscillator as well because the internal one uh, wouldn't have been accurate enough for uh, RS-232 uh, serial comms, especially over temperature. So I'm using an external resonator here. It's going to be 8 megahertz. Um, it's an 18 mega 168 still, or it could be a uh, 328, whichever Arduino uh, uh, compatible one you desire. But basically, I have uh, freed up the uh, ISP interface here, which also goes off to a secondary connector, which we'll look at. I've added a um, cap here to the reset pin. I've totally uh, separated that out, and I've decided to drive the uh, RGB LEDs directly from uh, pulse width modulation outputs. We'll probably take a look at that as well, but uh, yeah, there are a few changes, and there are a few things I had to keep on the microcontroller as opposed to dedicating them to these I.O. here. So let's discuss that. And you'll notice I've also freed up the AREF pin as well and added some bypassing to ground just if you happen to use the internal referen reference, which we're not actually using it because we have external ADCs and DACs, but this project is designed to be uh, expandable so you can use it beyond its original scope. So there's quite a lot of functionality in this circuit now, so how do you decide what things to drive directly from the micro and what things you put 
on your external I.O. chips over here. And well, in this case, I've dedicated one I.O. chip to outputs. You can, these are actually uh, bi-directional. Uh, we'll have a look at these uh, in more detail later, but these are bi-directional I.O. I squared C interface. They're on the same I squared C bus, different programming address down here. I guess we're having a look at it now, aren't we? So there you go. You can actually um, have eight of these chips on the same bus by actually programming them with the three address pins there. So I've dedicated one to uh, input switches. So I'm using four of, still got four input switches like I used before, but I've got room for four more. So if you're expanding this project um, and you want to add like a, uh, a keypad matrix or something like that, you've got eight um, uh, key switch inputs or you know you can use them as outputs as well if you really want to and but I've dedicated one chip to IO up, up here and because uh, actually this one down here that is inputs um, it's uh, you know it's fairly important to be able to interrupt from those so it, it actually has an interrupt output pin here so I've taken that back to the micro so I obviously had to use one of the pins over here for the interrupt input but because I dedicated this one over here to outputs, um, then I didn't need to hook up that uh, interrupt output pin back to the micro there. So in terms of these output pins here, which ones have I chosen to actually be on the I2C chip instead of the microcontroller? Well, you have to remember that the I2C chip, once you, um, once you hook things onto here, you lose some uh, capability like pulse width modulation and things like that. You can still do it, but you've got to do it via the I2C bus. It doesn't have any internal hardware capability to do uh, PWM or other uh, fast stuff like that. So really, um, you only want to put your non-critical output uh, signals on here, and that's exactly what I've done. I've put the ADC chip select over here, the DAC uh, chip select. I've put the uh, range uh, I.O. which actually selects the microcurrent uh, range up here. So that's, you know, that only switches once every blue moon. And lastly, I've got the LCD reset here. So uh, that's a non-critical signal as well. So, and I've got four spare. So if you want to hook on any external circuitry, you can. You've got those four lines available. So the ones I've actually put on the micro here, let's have a look at them. Now, of course, the fast stuff like the SPI interface, you want to put directly on your micro, even though I'm not using the internal hardware SPI capability, which is actually multiplexed um, onto these um, ISP pins, which I wanted to free up. So I'm not using the hardware um, uh, SPI uh, interface. I'm using just a uh, regular I.O. So I'm just going to what's called bit bang the uh, SPI interface, but that's no problems at all. But you want to, but because you want that to be reasonably fast, you're always sampling that ADC and DAC via the, uh, you know, you might sample it at one kilohertz or a couple hundred hertz or something. You're always doing it via that. So if you put it on the I squared C interface, oh, there's just overhead there you don't want. So um, sure enough, I've got the um, SPI uh, D in there, which is the data that comes from the ADC, the ADC data uh, out, and uh, sorry, the data in, which goes to both the uh, DAC and the uh, ADC, and then the data output from the ADC there, and um, the interrupt um, input uh, coming from the I squared C device, and there's the um, SPI clock as well. So that's the um, SPI interface. That um, interrupt reset pin has nothing to do with it. So it's only those three pins there, data and clock, and the chip select um, is a little bit slower. So I've decided to put those over to the I squared C because uh, some of the other pins I have to dedicate onto here. Like there's the I squared C bus. I'm using the internal I squared C uh, in, inside here. See SDA and SCL there. SDA and SCL here. That means I'm using the internal hardware I squared C interface. And you want to do that. I don't want to have to bit bang that one as well. Um, I've got the reset pin totally separate. And I've also got the uh, serial, the hardware UART output as well. And once again, you can tell it's a hardware device because the pin label is RXD and TXD. There's a hardware UART inside there, so we're using that. And they go off to a generic I.O. connector, or just a header connector, we can use for um, serial expansion. And these are rotor encoders. Once again, I've got the four signals, A and B, uh, phase coming from the two rotary encoders down here, and I could have put those on an I squared uh, C input, but I would have had to put it on uh, this one here, which actually um, had the interrupts 
um, coming back because you want to be able to interrupt when you turn the actual knob. So it was it just didn't work out just the way I configured these chips. So it was better uh, to put those directly onto the uh, micro controller pins here. And uh, the good thing about the AVR, or you know, a lot of good um, modern microcontrollers will have this, but they will have um, interrupt capability on all the pins. And you can see it there, PC interrupt, you know, 18 and so forth. So 19, 20, so almost virtually every pin has interrupt capability. So we've got interrupt capability on those four uh, rotary encoder inputs there. Now, before I had a just one LED for indication, but I decided, oh, what the hell, I'll gild the lily again, and I'll use the RGB uh, backlight capability in my LCD displays. So why not drive them with the pulse width modulator, and then you can vary the brightness of those uh, three RGB LEDs. So once again, you can't put PWM on the output of your I squared C here. It's just not going to be pretty. It's not going to work. You're better off using the internal PWM capability of this device. And here's the three here, uh, L, uh, B, L, G, and L, R. So they're the red, green, and blue, and they're connected through to the pins which have OC or an output compare module, OC, uh, B, and uh, OC, O, A. So you have to make sure you get these on the right pins, otherwise you won't be able to use the internal um, PWM capability which uses the output compare module. You have to go into and look at the AVR data sheet if you want to understand how all that sort of works, but PWM uses the output compare module. So there's only a few pins available. I think there's only five or six total on this device. So you have to connect those LEDs through to those pins with OC capability. And then the entire AVR ISP capability, including the uh, select pin SS there, goes up to an expansion, or I've got a couple of expansion connectors up here. So that's my generic um, serial interface connector, which you can hook up to probably, you know, Ethernet, RS-232, isolated RS-232, USB, uh, wireless, whatever you want to do some sort of Zigbee module or something, you can hook it up and it's got full capability to interface through to the SPI bus. And uh, why not, while I'm at it, make that compatible with those uh, FTDI uh, Arduino serial programming boards. So not only can you program the Arduino, not, not only program the micro through the regular ISP interface, but you can do it through the TX and RX uh, pins which use the internal bootloader in the AVR micro. So these are the bottom five pins here, um, 10 through to 6 there, are the same pinout as the FTDI, those generic FTDI boards you can buy for 5 or 10 bucks or something like that. So there's a couple of ways that you can program this board. And as you can see, I've thrown on the other uh, SPI pins up there, as well as the RS-232 hardware UART, the reset pin for good measure, just in case you need that for some reason, I needed to fill up an extra pin. Um, I was going to put 5 volts on that connector, but it, on the layout of the board, it wasn't that great. I got, it was like the last pin I wanted to connect, and it was just, I don't know, it, it was just in the middle of nowhere, and I couldn't get it through. Uh, it was a pain in the butt, so I decided, nah, bugger it, I'll put the reset pin anyway. And this extra I.O. one over here is for the key switches. My four switches are already hooked onto there, but uh, you can hook on your own or you can use them for I.O. or anything you want. And that has 3.3 um, uh, volts and ground as well. So, um, and this has 3.3 volts as well, so you can power external boards straight from those I.O. connectors. And why not? Just for good measure, I've added an I2C bus expansion, just a four pin uh, sill header there that uh, has SDA and SCL and power and ground. So if you want to hook on other uh, I2C devices, you can do that. And when it comes to choosing one of these uh, I2C serial expansion I.O.s, once again, I did the parametric search on DigiKey and, and pretty much for a dip device I wanted and microchip, came up again, it's the MCP uh, 23008, and it's just an SPI interface, it's got programmable address lines, and eight uh, user-definable input and output lines. You can software configure them, you send data through and you set them up first, and then you can use them as I.O., just like on a regular microcontroller. It's great, as I mentioned, it's got an interrupt uh, output capability, you can actually uh, reset the things if you need to, 
and Power and Ground, and that's it. And they're pretty cheap. They're only like a dollar twenty in one off, or less than eighty cents um, in volume. So pretty much a uh, no-brainer in terms of uh, choosing these devices. As for the microcurrent circuit here, uh, it's the same as before, except I have changed the gain. It was 200 before. I've now upped it to uh, 500 so that I can get one microamp bit uh, resolution for a 12-bit uh, converter. And that was just nicer than 2.5 microamps. I like that nice round number so that your uh, ADC can read each bit equals one microamp. And on the output here, I've replaced the reverse uh, shocky diode with an SA12AG uh, TVS, which is a, um, a transient voltage suppressor or a transorb or whatever you want to call them. They go under various names. And uh, this is a 12 volt uh, Zener, so it will uh, actually uh, clamp any over voltage um, on the output as well as offering a uh, reverse diode protection as well and because I'll get complaints of throwing in the option of the reverse protection diode between input and output on the voltage regulator there if you want to use it put it in if not leave it out one of the key aspects with choosing an op amp for this particular design is that it must have um, capability to have the input pins go down and sense near zero so it's got to have an input common mode range that includes zero volts and most uh, single supply uh, op amps will usually um, have this sort of thing and it also must be able to go down to uh, zero volts or near ground on the output now if it's a regular dual supply op amp like the um, NJM1455-8 uh, that I thought from my rusty memory that it actually had that capability it turns out that it doesn't because um, the outputs from the uh, DAC here, they can go between, you know, 0 and 2.048 volts, and that goes directly into the input of the op amp there. So it must be capable, the inputs must be capable of going down to ground, and likewise the outputs, because our output voltage can go down to uh, 0 uh, volts of our power supply, we need output to go down to 0 as well. So we need a good single supply op amp. And here's the NJM14558 uh, device, and my rusty memory was no good at all. Uh, while it had the uh, input offset, I didn't uh, bother to check um, that it was actually uh, single supply uh, capable, and it turns out it's, it's not. If we actually go down here and take a look at um, this bit here, the input common mode voltage range, VICM, there it is there, then it's only plus minus three or typical plus minus four volts from a plus minus five volt supply up around here, up there. So uh, really, you're, um, it's, it does not have that capability for the inputs to go down to the negative rail because it's plus minus five. It only goes down to, uh, say, plus minus four. Typically, it only does a volt. Um, above and below the rails. And if you're using it as a single supply op amp, like we are in this um, situation here, as you can see, we've got uh, V plus there and we've got ground, um, it's a single supply op amp. So it's not going to do uh, what we want there. It's no good. So uh, we had to choose another op amp. So I went through the parametric searches and all that sort of stuff and bingo, um, I came up with the uh, TLC uh, 272, which uh, should uh, do the job for us. Let's take a look at this one. Now if we look at the top level specs up here, it says 500 uh, microvolts maximum there, uh, offset voltage at uh, VDD 5 volts, great, uh, it looks uh, pretty stable. It's power supply capability, very important, uh, 3 volts to 16 volts, so that's our maximum input, that covers our maximum and minimum input range, no problems at all, and bingo, single supply operation. When it says that, then you know um, that you're in with the shot of this thing having, um, you know, the output is going to sense ground and it's going to uh, go um, to ground on the output as well. And it says, look at this, common mode input voltage range extends below the negative rail. So your inputs can not only go to zero, they can go a little bit negative as well. And some op amps have that capability. We don't really need it here, but if you need that sort of capability, then this thing can do it. And this chip actually has uh, four different grades available, and the different grades uh, determine what the maximum output offset voltage is. So it says here uh, four 
output offset grades are available um, from the C and I suffixes ranging from the low cost uh, TLC272 with no letters afterwards which is 10 millivolts not suitable for us we want better than 10 millivolts to the high precision TLC277 which does 500 microvolts well let's take a look at um, the various other uh, the various devices and see which one we need to choose and by the way here's that uh, bell shaped uh, characteristic uh, curve of the input offset voltage plus minus 400 microvolts there for the high precision TLC 277 so that's what you can typically expect most are going to appear in fact in their batch testing there most appeared um, in the center here which is slightly offset from zero it's offset by about 150 microvolts or 200 microvolts or thereabouts on the positive side but that's the sort of spread that you can expect uh, if, if you're really going for some sort of really high precision application um, that's where they can fall your chances of getting one right out here right at the spec windows is quite small but odds are the bulk are going to sort of fall within that margin in there and here you go this is the table which uh, shows the uh, different offset voltages for the different part numbers from the very high precision TLC TLC277 CP so it's not the 272 it's the 277 um, and that's uh, 500 microvolts up there so uh, let's uh, take a look and it's available in plastic dip as well so really you know ideally we'd want that 500 microvolts one but the 277 is quite expensive compared to the 272 so let's see if the uh, 272 in the uh, B grade there you see how it's got the B after the letter there's A C and B they're kind of out of order it's weird you would think that the A would be 10 millivolts the B would be 5 and the C might be 2 millivolts or the other way around but no they've sort of got them all muddled up eh. Who knows what they'll think in there when they actually did that. Um, maybe it was an afterthought. They uh, did A and B and then they decided, ah, oh, we'll do a real cheap, crappy C version as well and just muddied the waters. Anyway, that's from a temperature range of 0 to 70. We're not going to need that full range, so let's go check out the uh, temperature specs of this thing because this is going to be a maximum, see? VIO max. So let's check out what a uh, typical value is and here's the internal circuitry and you'll notice that yes it's actually CMOS it uses uh, MOSFETs instead of uh, traditional bipolar uh, transistors and uh, this is using the uh, LIN CMOS process which is a um, silicon gate uh, proprietary Texas instruments one but this is a CMOS device and the advantage of uh, using a CMOS device instead of a more traditional uh, BJT uh, di type device is that um, generally they're going to be uh, much lower power, they're going to be uh, single supply, you know, input rail to rail, input to output, things like that. So uh, uh, sort of CMOS devices are in general going to be a better choice for an application that we're doing here. There's something else interesting in a data sheet. You can see the uh, layout of the die you can see the uh, output uh, they'd be the output transistors there I'm assuming they've even marked it on the uh, silicon die I'm assuming that's an accurate uh, implementation of the die that they're actually uh, using in this device and with regards to the common mode input voltage here you can see let's say at VDD uh, 5 volts it can actually go negative to down to uh, minus 0.2 volts and it'll go as high as uh, 3.5 volts so not quite a rail to rail input and here's our guaranteed and uh, typical and maximum input offset voltages for the different grade devices A, B and uh, C grade devices so let's take a look at uh, say the B grade here which is the uh, best one out of the in the 272 you've got to go to a 277 to get better and the typical is around about Look, it's very similar to the C, uh, to the 277 uh, model. So the 272B, it's around 230 microvolts typical. So that's going to be typical at 25 degrees C or over the full temperature range. You know, it's guaranteed uh, to be uh, less than um, 3,000 3, microvolts, 3 millivolts. Um, so, you know, it's sometimes it's not good design practice to in general you could say it's not good design practice to design around a typical figure but in our case because that is much lower than what we need it's going to be good enough uh, don't want to you know spend the extra money for the TLC 277 it's like two or three times the price or something it's not like 10 or 20 percent extra it's a significant price jump between that device and that device so 
Um, really, you know, and there's a big jump between the B version and the next best, which is the A version here, 230 microvolts typical uh, offset at 25 to 0.9. So that's a big jump there. So, you know, you probably could get away with the A version, but the B version is probably the go, I think. And as for power consumption of the device, uh, for two amplifiers, a total of, uh, you know, at 25 degrees, 1.4 milliamps maximum for both amplifiers. It's not the lowest power device uh, on the market, but it's good enough for our purposes. And if you look at uh, VOL here, the low level output voltage, um, if, if you drive the input at minus 100 millivolts, um, the output will actually uh, go down to zero typically, that's a typical figure, or a maximum of 50 millivolts. Well, I think we're going to get, you know, it's going to be a lot better than 50, I think. But technically, if you're designing around maximum uh, variation specs and it's critical, then you'd have to take that 50 millivolts into account, and in theory, it won't get down to uh, zero volts output. But, you know, we don't care if our uh, power supply can only get down to 50 millivolts output. whoop de doo so there you have it. That's uh, Rev B of the schematic and uh, some thoughts into uh, why I went into uh, changing things and how you saw how just changing that one little uh, reset, freeing up that one reset pin, you know, changed, drove all my extra design decisions. I went to external, uh, forced me to use external I squared C devices. I could gild the lily with RGBs and add a few other things and add some more uh, serial output capability. You know, and this is all part of uh, system engineering. When you're doing this sort of thing, which I'll have to do some more uh, system engineering stuff where in a future video in this power supply series when we start talking about the case and the PCB design and things like that. So all that's uh, coming up, hopefully. I've got some PCB uh, layout videos on how I laid out the board and I'll talk about system engineering with the case and how that drove some of the design factors and things like that. So there's more to come. Um, if you want the uh, PDF of this uh, schematic, just go to uh, the blog website and it'll be there for download. So I'll catch you next time.